G'day doggies fans, all things Bulldogs. It's the podcast episode 18, some big things to talk about. I want to discuss Stephen Crichton or Blake Taff, who's going to be fullback. What are the scenarios? What's it depend on? The balance of our side. What are each going to bring to the table? I'll give you some some of the um, estimated stats that I've got from Crichton as a fullback um, and how I think it'll play out, what I think they'll do and what I would like to see them do which may be two different things. We'll talk about the Broncos and Panthers. What a great win by the Panthers. The three-peat, well done to Stephen Crichton um, and all involved. Obviously, myself and Dane, our tips were horrible. Um, Dane will be coming on again don't, for those who missed Dane. Um, and we'll be talking about um, all the top 30s and predictions and that sort of stuff for next year once we get some more information on that. Um, I'm going to talk about my early tips for the top eight in 2024. And even looking at it now, I'm already seeing that it's wrong. <laughs> like it just changes from day to day. But we'll get something out there and see how close we get. That's obviously going to change when top 30s are finalised and we see the draw. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the internationals. And on that note, congratulations to Carla Lawafu. Fantastic um, being selected. I hope it works out well for Carl. Um I hope he's not put in a situation where he's overawed and and it you know scar gets any scars that he finds it hard to learn from. We just don't know how people react and how young people react to certain adversity. So you know we saw some greats have some shockers in um, big matches like I like I remember Justin Hodges and had some shockers, but he went on to do some great things for the Broncos and Queensland and the Roosters. So. Um, after a shocker in origin to start his career. Um, so we'll look at that and the grand final and the international games as well. So the Panthers win again. They Congratulations to them. Um, pretty much everything Phil Gould has said about the Penrith Panthers, apart from stupidly, in my opinion, saying they're going to win by 30. I think you're just poking the bear. Um, I don't know. He says what he believes and you can't knock him for that. I, I don't know if there was an agenda with it, but um, it's just something I wouldn't be doing. You know, he could easily have just tipped the, the Panthers could have been great and won by 14, you know what I mean? Tip them by eight, you know. But uh, to me, the, the Broncos defence defensively were the better side over the and because they ran out of puff due to having to defend so much in that first half, that's what cost them in the end. Um, and obviously, there some young players in their team had some moments which which were fears of that's where Brisbane were going to lose the match. Some stage fright in areas. Um, some mistakes they made, some decisions they made in that first half, which meant that they only had 12 sets with the ball as opposed to the Panthers having 20, 21. And the Panthers completed 36 out of 37 sets and won the game in the last two minutes against a team that which had 62% completion over the match. Like, if that doesn't scare you as a Penrith Panthers fan, I don't know what will. They've had to play almost perfectly with the ball um, as far as retention and completing their sets and forcing the Broncos to make another tackle um, to get there in that way that they did. To me, the Bronco, Phil Gould's off the mark with his um, discussions on the Broncos' defence. I think the Broncos' defence is back to the levels that it was at when, you know, they were had that aura and fear about them. And I still think, and I think that aura and fear is there. And you could see by the turnout of the fans and you can, you can tell by the Broncos fans around here, you can, um, you know, they've got all the, you know, all, all the ones jumping on ship now when they're winning, you get all them with, in Brisbane. They've got about 30,000 fans though. And, and they're, they're just as one-eyed and passionate as, as anyone else. You know, um, that'll be there every single week to watch the boys play. And they've got that 
that arrogance back where they think they're going to win everything, where that they don't expect to lose anything. And that's been achieved through this one season. But it all started last year. Um, how do I put it? I think the Panthers I think, and Ivan Cleary, the scary thing for other teams is that I'm pretty sure he would have learned some lessons out of that match. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it. If they're going to continue winning premierships and making the big dance and doing all that stuff, they're going to have to play more football against a team like Brisbane. And there'll be teams that um, will play to outlast them. You know, if Brisbane hold the ball for 30, you know, for 80% or 75%, they, they win that match. They win that match. Penrith don't have the legs in that last bit to do it. So it comes back to this system that they've tried to install for years. It, the system become about that other teams, that the team would never beat itself and other teams would have to beat them. And the Broncos show that, you know, for that period there, that when, that, that when they played footy and, and the pass is stuck, the Panthers' defence cracked, as would many others. Um, I think both those sides go on and win, defeat any of the grand finalists of the last six or seven years, and I can't go any further than that. They, I think they beat they they beat Melbourne and Canterbury in 2012. They, I think they beat every team for the last decade, to be honest, both sides. The Broncos' talent, their speed, and under the conditions of grand finals and, and, and origin and that sort of stuff, the players in their side, the speed that they have and the size that they've got and the, and the motors that they've got, the engines, the athleticism, um, is suited to these games where the referee doesn't in, interfere as often. And you've got to generate speed at the play of the ball. You know, if you win the ruck, it's because you've, you know, your player's done something special to break through the line and, and had the opposition team sort of, you know, under under the pump. But wherever there's an, an opportunity for two or three players to get in the tackle and slow down the ruck in these games, they're able to do it effectively. I felt that G, he let a lot of... Um, Grubbery go. Jordan Rick, he's, you know, he's gone turning this aggressive player, but I don't know how many times he can stick knees into ribs and, and you know, and rub his elbows into people's faces and stuff like that and keep getting away with it. Absolutely plays like a grub now, but I think it comes down to the fact that he was sort of looked at as a bit of a pretty boy and, and maybe he's a bit soft or one of the weaker players and he's asserted himself as a damaging player. And, you know, if he's looking at players like Gordon Tullis as his, as his mentors, um, you know, being aggressive gets you places in the NRL. So, yeah, I felt he was a grub. I felt there was a lot of grub tactics from both sides, high tackles that went unpunished. Um, but if anyone got a rub of the green, it was the Broncos. In saying all of that, I felt that, you know, the penalty that they got late in that second half, first half for, um, I think, was it Spencer Lenu holding the player down? It could have, he could have given that penalty 100 times to either side. So I felt that it was, wasn't was warranted um, just to give the one for that. Might as well not given it. And then the try, I don't believe it was a try. And I don't know how he could have given an opinion on that try to say, yeah, hey, mate. There needs to it needs to come back and say ref um, ref doesn't know, and then if the bunker doesn't know, no try. Why does it have to influence the scoreboard? Maybe they, if it's it's no try, maybe they give the possession back to the attacking side. They get one more tackle if it's the last tackle, or it's a repeat of the play. They can't ascertain what happened. Maybe they look at doing something like that. I don't know. Probably not.
probably a ridiculous rule. Um, but no way did I think he got the ball down, and I felt that it was short. And there was no conclusive evidence anywhere. More so to the fact that he didn't score. That's how it appeared. So why was it given a try? In a way, I think it teaches Penrith a lesson, though, who never looked like scoring. They scored out of luck. Um, but maybe they need to play more footy because the team they beat had 62% possession or whatever it was and, and had the game won. And, you know, that win obviously does a lot for the Penrith's belief in their club. It was their greatest premiership success, I believe. It was... Um, but they did so many things wrong in that match as well, um, especially defensively, I felt, um, which which helped. I, th I felt that Moses Leota was himself, Stephen Crichton and the two wingers were the best players on the field. I felt Jack Cogger made a difference. He straightened up the attack. Um, both edge back rowers played well and the two props from Penrith were, were fantastic. Um, Dylan Edwards did his thing. You know, there's comparisons between... See, a lot of um, stuff's been put on Adam Reynolds. And look, the grubby media, <laughs> like this is what they've got to talk about. Adam Reynolds was brought there to bring a job, but on, on when it counted, he failed. Maybe the case, but they don't make it without him. And I know one of them said that as well. He's brought there to help manage a young side. And he already, he's basically gets treated like the coach in the press conferences. For, for a long time there, they would ask Adam as many questions as they would ask Kevy, which is unheralded. I think Kevy, um, I, I don't know, there's something which just see, it seems odd the way they treat Kevin sometimes, I think. I think he's a very good coach, obviously. And he has high standard, standards and belief. And, um yeah I, I felt that reese walsh for instance they were saying he didn't do nothing in the first half well one team had 20 sets to the other team's 12. reese walsh wasn't catching the ball with clean air and being able to run 20 meters so it all comes it's all circumstantial and Dylan Edwards also takes every fourth tackle hit up. Now, Reese Walsh isn't going to do that off a slow play of the ball, is he? He's just going to get crushed, crunched. That's not what he's there for. He's there to have miles on his legs to take on the defence um, off their good work that they do and their, their players. Jesse Arthurs, Selwyn Cobbo, Katani Staggs and, Hunt and Farmworth, they all do the yardage. Reese Walsh is there to, um, he's only going to make big meters when he's coming into the game off, you know, um, getting that room to run. Penrith weren't giving him the room to run. And what's the point of him running the ball just to take a hit up? Unless his team's absolutely flat out on their back and he's fresh and can do that. That's when they do it obviously, but he's not that type of player. See, they keep comparing players just because they play the same positions, but their team utilise them differently. It's like comparing Brian Toto with Josh Adokar. Now, Josh Adokar, his metres are only high when he's been put into the clear to score tries, you know, or if he, you know, makes a break. When he's running the ball out of yardage, which he'll do for the team, and he, he toughens up, he's making five, ten metres and sometimes getting pushed back. He sort of launches his shoulder in and doesn't usually concede or aggress ground at all. But um, they're different players. Yet you get Jacob Carraz running off yardage, he's going to make 10, 15 metres. You know what I mean? It's same with Greg Marju and, and Dominic Young, Solomon Cobbo, all these big wingers. DWZ, they're off the back fence, big bodies. And you've got the fullbacks that either do the – are able to get that good run out of yard um, when they catch the ball because they, they're always well positioned. Their forwards have got control of the ruck. They, 
you're catching the ball in the 15 metres and running it out to the 25 to the 30 mark every time. And then they're running it again on hit up four. And their forwards, all their forwards have to do is tackle. And their forwards don't really do the hit ups until they're in the opposition's area and they're, and they're attacking where they get that big steam up near the line or to get some uh, momentum in the play the ball. Teams utilise different players differently. I know it's a common sense thing to say and an obvious thing to say, but you'd think that the way the media go on, that everyone's in the same sort of the same basket and it's all being tarred with the same brush. It's ridiculous. Adam Reynolds, at least he went after the, the plays. He failed. There was, what, four drop kicks that he failed on. But he went after the play. Now, was it needed at the time? That's, you know, I, I think it also comes down in, in a grand final of if, if I'm going to kick long off a dropout, is that me backing my defence or is that me not backing my boys to get possession from the dropout? Like, what is the percentage play? They did concede a try off it. When Farmworth knocked it back, it was the only try they conceded in that first half. So lots to talk about in that. Um, but I think, look, Nathan Cleary got five Churchill medal. I would have been happy to see it go to Moses Leota, but it was always going to go to Nathan Cleary after what happened. His 40-20 off the third tackle, the break he made, and then the try he scored at the end. Um, Stephen Crichton's crunch plays. And this is stuff I want to talk about because I know Blake Tath has that. But I've seen him utilise it in two grand finals, um, New South Wales Cup and in the state championship. Um, then playing for South in the grand final and in games where he's played fullback, where he plays fullback. If he's needed to do a, a short kick in behind or, or anything like that or to ball play, he can do it all. He's got all the skills. He's fast. But Stephen Crichton forced two six, two um, repeat sets through beautiful little kicks, whereas they, where they couldn't get past the Broncos' defence and force them into another set of defence, and they eventually cracked. So he was just as instrumental in that. Now, I've always struggled to say that he's anyone with X Factor, but I think that X Factor is starting to, you know, put egg on my face. I think he, he just has this knack of being there in big moments and scores for his fourth grand final in a row. But he's a player that's always going to have the opportunity to score as well. It's, it's another thing people don't take into account. Um, I think he had a, so much more steel and determination in his year this year. Much more aggression in his defence, much more attitude in his attack hit harder, hit the contact harder, um, competed more heavily, more more intensity in all of areas of his game, less moments where he switched off, which was always something you would see from time to time from Stephen over the last few years, but he's still very young. Himself, Burton, Lenu, all those players, Mitch Kenny, they're all the same age, all played together. So there you go. So we're going to talk about Crichton and, and Taff and where I think they should all line up. Um, what have we got here? But let's talk about, so well done to Penrith. I think Penrith and Brisbane both win, beat any side in the last 10 years. In very finals, I think they were that good. Um, the teams and it's going to be hard for other teams to progress because all these teams up the top of the ladder at the moment um, are so well rehearsed in the methods and the practices and the systems that they believe in over a fair bit of time. I know the Broncos, you know, fell off a cliff in 2020, then had to slowly come back under Kevy over the next three years, but the system they've got in place with their juniors and their progression of juniors and the players they're going to have to let go and the players they're replacing with is is not too far off where Penrith are. Um, 
that they've got that all sorted out now. Penrith has so well rehearsed it that it's it's going to they're going to continue along those lines. Now, if they learn from that grand final that they have to play a bit more football, because be rest assured, if they play Brisbane again next year, Brisbane aren't going to have sixty two percent possession. I can tell you that now. Some of the players that fail either won't be there, or they will um, be better for the run and won't make those same mistakes. You pretty much guarantee that. Um, but Penrith are going to be more rehearsed and more professional at what they do again because they're another year down the track. So with all these teams now so close in their preparations, in their science, in their you know their, their centre of excellence is being built and the way they go about it, everything, their preparation, it's and the balance of their squads and their tactics that they use. They just find themselves when they come up against a better side. As soon as one of their players cracks, that's the difference. And that one percent difference is it can all can just unravel a side. And, and you see a team go from competing to being put under the pump and getting smashed pretty quickly as the season progresses. So, look, I've I've I'm going to show you my early tips for the top eight in twenty twenty four. Um, prior to the draw or top 30s being finalised. So it's going to change. And even looking at it now, I think it's completely ridiculous. But let's have a look at it anyway. I embarrassed myself as it is, so why not do it again? I've got the Broncos to get over themselves and not be crushed by that defeat in the finish minor premiers. Penrith up there again. Roosters better for the run. Knights better for the run. Eels to have a better draw and to come into it again. Sharks, Seagulls, Dolphins. So the teams I'm leaving out. Storm and the Rabbits to fall off a cliff. Western Dragons to have better years but still finish way below. Canterbury to go to 12th. Although I should be saying we're going to win this year because of all of that, you know, all those omens. We, lose, we win it in 84, lose it in 94. Win it in 2004, lose it in 2014. Win it in 2024. Our jersey flag won in 2003. Before we won in 2004, will our jersey flag win in 2023? Does that mean we're going to win the NRL in 2024? I think the Eels will do a lot better. They'll be more rehearsed with the players that come into their side. Um... They've got a style of play that works. Two wins over Penrith this year isn't easy. They had a lot of losses by two points, one point, four points. Um, they should have made the eight. I think the Roosters were starting to realise their identity again. And if they don't have another bad season with injuries, I think all the young players which um, have developed over the last few years are going to be um, in a much better position to contribute and do well for that side. Um, I think the Warriors, look, they've still got some good players, not seeing too many players go to their club this year. I think they will, it could be an issue if Sean Johnson gets another injury. I just think they're going to be right there when, it, you know, when the whips are cracking, but just miss out. I think the Cowboys are another side that I'm not sure whether they're going to recover after this year. But they've definitely got, you know, Drinkwater and the like are all good players. Valentine Holmes, and they've still got that forward pack, can do a lot of damage. Um, I think Newcastle, with the addition of Jack Cogger, I think their spine's really good. And I think he's going to gain a lot of confidence for that. And look, they lose, lose Dominic Young and Fitzgibbon off the edge, which is big for them. But I think they've got the players to make it work, and I think they'll do well. Um, Titans could, under Des, they'll have an uplift. They've got a lot of talent in that team. I think the Raiders are going to fall off the cliff. Dead set off the cliff this year, the Raiders, is my tip. Um, but we will see. We will see for sure. Look, it could be, it just, it's just such a close competition. I look at that and 
maybe Brisbane fall off the cliff because of what happened and the players don't get over it and they get a few injuries and they're done. You know, maybe the Bulldogs are up there competing for the top four. I think the Dogs are going to shock a lot of people at the start of the season. I think come 10 rounds, I think we'll be at least seven wins. It's pretty hard to say. No, we don't have the draw to jump in the gun. I think we'll be in for a lot of pain over the season, is my gut feel. Um, but, yeah, I've just got a feeling with the preseason, as long as we don't have major injuries, I, I really believe they're going to come out far and hopefully we see a couple more big boppers signed that um, we're looking forward to seeing. So there you go. Um, the international sides. There's some really good teams there. Um, I think I think Oluwapu is going to play in the first um, test against Australia. So let's have a look at these sides. I think Falago, mind the spelling, it hasn't been done properly. Brian Toto, I think Crichton, Targo in the wings with, with Jesse Arthurs. I think Oluwapu and Arcee will be the halves. I think Junior Paulo and um, Wojtika Manu will be the prop forwards. Leilua and Luki on the edge with Palacia as the lock, Lemu, Lemuelu, um, Royce Hunt, Spencer Lenu, and Greg Marju on the bench. So that's the team I reckon they'll pick for the game against Australia. Australia will be Tedesco, Cobo, um, Staggs, the Hammer, the Fox, pending the investigation. I think he'll be fine. Um, Cameron Munster, um, DCE, Jake Turbo with Ben Hunt as well. Um, and we'll see the rest of it coming up in a moment. Um, just waiting for the side to come up. So Jake Turbo will start. They'll have Ben Hunt to start at hooker like usual and Grant starting from the bench. That's how they've done it recently. And Payne Huss, obviously. Cameron Murray on the edge with Martin. Isaiah Yo to get the, get the start over Carrigan, but it could go the other way. Tino off the bench and either Collins, Flegler or Cotter to be picked as that last middle to get. With New Zealand, Nickel Kodstak at fullback. Ozarko, Joey Manu, Tomoko, Mulatalo. Brown, Dylan Brown, Jerome Hughes, Fisher Harris, New Brown, I think will get the start, Leota, Nakora, Papali'i, and Tapine, Tapini, Tapini, um, Foran, Leo Thompson, Nelson Asafa Solomona, and Griffin Neem to be on the bench. Um, haven't got the other teams which have been selected, but that's the teams I think they will pick. Um, and I think Falago can start as their fullback and be their X factor for the Samoan team because they've got all those uh, the meter eaters out of from Jesse Arthur's to or well, they can use Greg Marju either or um, plus they've got all those big forwards as well who can do a lot of meter work and then have that full their fullback play more in that Reese Walsh style and uh, and young Carlo Lawapu. Now, Carl Lawapu, if he has a really good series and shows he can play at that level, you'll find he'll probably put him in good stead to get a starting spot come 2024. For me personally, I feel that he should be starting in New South Wales Cup if there's better options and, and work his way through. And the harder the journey for him to get to first grade next year or the year after, I think the better player he will be in the long run. But that's just my opinion. He's very young. He's still eligible for SG ball. Um, he's got the world in front of him. And and congratulations to him being selected. No mean feat. A lot of faith in his ability, obviously. And uh, hopefully he can uh, 
just put pay at any questions that, that us fans have got and whether he'll get it done. So we'll go and uh, I'll show you the best 17 that I named. I've got Taff, Perez, Bronson, Cherry. And this isn't to start the season. This is when they're all playing at their best. Stephen Crichton, Addo Carr, Burton, Toby Sexton, Max King, Reed Marnie, Liam Knight, Kikau, Preston. Now I've got Takiaho, pending being signed. Man, pending being signed. Sutton, Chris Patolo, and Jamin Salmon. Um, we may see some other players get brought into the club and there's a whole bunch of youngsters there, the likes of Harrison Edwards, um, who may be someone we need to have in that team, Carl Olawapu as well, and um, Curtis Moran. Also like um, the other fellow, Stephen Hughes, Sam Hughes, I should say. No relation. So that brings us to Stephen Crichton versus... Blake Tack. Now, Crichton averages over 200 metres as a fullback. There's been games he's made 290 and close. He'll make metres. He'll do the hit-up. He'll do the hit-up on tackle on hit-up for more of a runner than a ball player, but he, he does have the skills. They're just not as silky. Um, he doesn't seem to be the most... Um, look, he showed some good touch in the grand final, those short kicks, keeping possession for the side, and he competes for the high ball, and he's pretty good under it. Um, much more steeled and determined this year and rated as the centre of the year. Now, Blake Taft is a great ball player. He, his acceleration to the line is going to is help in creating overlaps. Nearly beat us himself in that game against Canterbury vs. South. Great short kicking game. Um, natural half, natural fullback. Always competes. Well placed for um, positional players. Great. Played the 21 grand final at fullback. Um, always been stuck behind Latrell Mitchell at South. Looking at the side that I named, if you've got Jacob Carraz, Bronson Cherry, and Stephen Crichton, um, and the Fox in your back five, you've got enough yardage there. Bronson Cherry is huge. And if he gets his timing back quickly, gets his football smarts back quickly, is defending, is playing with great and, and remains injury free, can handle all the contact and all that sort of stuff. And the muscle memory is going well. Um, he's going to be a player that should be dynamic out of yardage, but also to be kept for moments. To, to take advantage of the speed. You know, and I just think a player like Blake Taff is going to bring our edges into it more than what um, Stephen Crichton will. It's off the back of shape, as everyone likes to say. We've had a good set, our back line set. We're running off the play. I think Stephen Crichton running to the line isn't going to cause as many headaches as Blake Taff running at speed. And then Blake's going to be able to deliver to Stephen Crichton or Bronson Cherry either side. Um, and to have Preston and Kikau on either edge, I just see it working a lot better. And if you bring, we bring Gerald Skelton into the team, and to me, Gerald Skelton, if he get if he plays to his potential, he deserves to be there as well. It was hard not to include him. Um, we've just got to see what happens with Gerald. But looks a very good player in the making. Now, he can also do that yardage work as well, which keeps the players like the Fox fresh for the kicks in behind. Um I just think Crichton is going to be a, a, a dynamic centre. If we've got Burton, Sexton, Hickow and Taff running the show, off Reed Marnie. Obviously, we need our forwards to win that ruck and to give them the opportunity to do that. But off a slower ruck, and this is what I'm talking about, if we're playing off a slower ruck, do you need... 
um, there's nothing stopping Stephen Crichton getting in there and doing the yardage work, which he's good at. He can still make metres from the centre position and do the work. And has the fitness to, to make plays, to get a ball away, a little flick pass, do a little kick if he's got the ball in his hands and nothing much has happened to get a repeat set, showing he can do all that. I just think Blake Taft's going to be better at getting him the ball than what he's going to be at getting other players the ball. I think our centres are a bit more will have more benefit from having Blake Taft at fullback than having Stephen Crichton. Stephen Crichton. Two or three years, maybe. I just don't. He has that long striding, um, galloping style about him. He, he steps off both feet. He's awkward. He's stronger. He's very strong. He's very athletic. He can make tackle busts and stuff. But 10 metres out, you saw that try scored. It was fantastic. But it was at a time where the opposition were completely fatigued. And a lot of those tries he gets against are against fatigued teams with that ability there. Play like Tony Staggs can do that in the first minute with his strength. And farm worth breaking tackles all throughout the game. Um, Crichton is a very steady player. I love what he did in defence this year. I think... I think we're a better side with him in the defensive line at centre. I really do. So I don't see how putting him to the fullback position is going to be of 100% benefit. From what I, from that sort of team that I'm looking at there. Now, if we had, just say, Daniel Saifedi comes into that side and they get another good prop from somewhere, right? Who, who, who can compete with most sides and win their fair share of the ruck. That might change things a bit. But I think if we're in a, again in a situation where our forwards aren't getting parity in the middle, we need people who can generate speed. And that's where players like a Blake Taff are going to be very beneficial. Because if they can get on the outside of someone and create a half chance for a Stephen Crichton, he's the type of player who can then take advantage of it. I just don't think he's going to be able to bring people into the game the same way Blake Tapp can. I just don't. Um, it's it's going to be very interesting. I think they're going to go with Crichton at fullback. They probably will go with Crichton at fullback for Samara as well against Australia. Um, I wouldn't. I want to see that far longer ago. Um, but I really do think that they will stick with Stephen Crichton. I've got a feeling Blake Taff will start as a utility or start in New South Wales Cup, unfortunately. Or he may even start on the wing, which I think would be a tragedy. Um, for the balance of our team, him at fullback, I think he's good enough for first grade. I think he's a He's every, you know, if, if I had to pick a player out of Nick Meany and Blake Taff, from what I've seen of Taff, he plays first grade in most clubs. And I'd be picking him every day of the week. Um, has a little mistake in him as well. So, look, he may not work out for the dogs. It just may not work out. We don't know. But from what I've seen, if he plays to his potential, We've got a really good fine there, and he's going to be worth a fair bit more money than he's worth now once he gets going. But I've got a feeling they're going to start with him at either halfback. Um, I've got a feeling they might go with Burton and Taff in the halves and play Crichton at fullback. And young Toby will um, might find himself in reserve grade battling. Look, it's as far as our depth goes, it's not a bad thing. We've got young Joey O'Neill in the background. We've got Oluwapu in the background. But that's you, you want to have more depth. You want to have more depth. And but they're sort of they've got to work out quickly. Is Blake Taff going to be our half or is he going to be our fullback? 
So I think they can make that decision and then they need whatever they do, they have to stick with it. And if it's not working after nine or ten rounds, they might have to pull, pull the trigger early. If Hayes Perrin's still in the club, um, he's a he's a good he's a handy backup to have as a fullback as well. And who's to say he's still not in the picture? I know we don't see him in the picture, or most fans, and he's copped it from a lot of fans. But as far as I could see, he was trying his best. And there was no need to give him the crap that he got. And he had some good moments. It just just wasn't quite there um, in attack. It was funny watching Penrith in that grand final in the first half, their attack. Looked as clunky as the Bulldogs. That's how good their Broncos' defence was. Yeah, it was funny that. Do we proceed with this Penrith style where they're going to go out there and try and complete it 90% and then play footy off the back of it? Or are they going to go with that other style where they they try and do 40-20s off the third and fourth tackle when we haven't had possession? For, for the last 10 minutes and then put it out in the fall or have the person catch it on the fall at the 20 or keep it in and and then get back to our halfway again. Like, are they going to play with that with no composure? I still think they're trying to find out how they play as a team and they've got to work that out pretty quickly and stick to it and go about it and, and get it sorted over over a period of time. I don't believe we're going to be winning the grand final in 2024. If we do, you know, I might have to... It'll be a... To me, it's it's just one of those omen things, isn't it? But if, they win, if we win the grand final next year, bloody hell. How superstitious would that be? <laughs> um, anyway, waffled on enough. I think Blake Taff needs to be the fullback. Interested to hear what everyone else thinks. But for the purposes of what I said, Crichton, Karaz, um, Bronson Cherry when he's in the side, Skelton while he's there, Samrani if he's playing can do that job. Um, all these players can do the yardage job. Blake Taft's there for his ball playing, for his speed, um, to get in there to dummy half and be around the ball, to follow up around the ball, to follow the ball carriers through the middle. He's, he's elusive. He's fast. He, I just think he's just the, the person that they've got to go with based on the players we've got in our squad. But in saying all of that, um, that could change depending on any new recruits we we buy and how the team decides to go about things um, as far as the way they want to play their footy. Because um, I didn't know sometimes if we wanted to be a team that went out there and completed and grinded or wanted to be a team that took shortcuts and, and played too much razzle-dazzle and too much Hollywood footy when we hadn't earned the right yet. And um, it cost us some time. And there was games where I felt we were well on top and we only just got away with those matches. The games against the Souths, the game against the Dragons, the game against the Dolphins, um, the game against Wests. Way better than the opposition in those games and only just one. So thanks to everyone who's tuned in we'll have dane back shortly we're going to discuss the top 30s of other teams getting our early predictions i've got a few in there already i think i'm gonna have egg on my face whichever way i look at it um so i do expect the broncos to follow up roosters to and knights to consolidate eels to get back in there sharks to have a similar season seagulls to scrape their way in um and dolphins to to make the eight in only their second year in the competition with the Warriors, Cowboys, Titans, not 
performing quite to expectation. Storm and rabbits and raiders falling off a cliff. Dog slight improvement. Dragons and tigers similar to where they were last year. So there you go. Thanks everyone. Um, once we know the new players in the side, we'll talk about all the new recruits coming into the team and what they will do for Canterbury next year and what I believe will happen. Um, that'll be the new breed series that'll continue, but not enough in the signing department for me to persevere with that as yet. But that's a big question. Will Stephen Crichton be centre or fullback for Canterbury? Is it going to depend on what happens in these tests for Samoa versus Australia and New Zealand? Is that going to have a play on it? Will Carla Lawapu come into the team? These are all questions we've got to look at um, and talk about in the coming weeks. But um, I'm enjoying having a chat and getting the comments and answering people's queries and stuff. And I'll continue to do that as long as people keep interacting. I'll continue to provide my thoughts. Thank you very much. Well done to the Panthers again. Well done to everyone um, who got selected for their international teams. And also congratulations to Benny Barber, winning the player of the series in the Corey Knockout for his team, Walgett, which won the grand final after avenging their grand final loss last year. Take care, guys. Thanks very much and go the dogs.